As chair, I now call to order the October 10th, 2024 meeting of the Equity Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee members will state their name before speaking. Ms. Siebel, please call the roll of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Chike Kalu? Present. Ms. Harvey? Dr. Savoy? Ms. Tulusky? Present. Thank you. And Ms. Rempong? Present. Thank you. Ms. Siebel, please call the role of staff members on the Equity Committee participating in today's meeting. Uh, Dr. Rogers? Present. Ms. Charlie Green? Present. Mr. Handy? Present. Mr. McCall? Present. Ms. Stansberry? Present. Ms. Simons? Present. Mr. Hodge? Present. All right, do we have anyone else that I did not call? I think we're good to go. Thank you, Ms. Siebel. The first item on the agenda is human resources update. And for that, I call on Mr. Homer McCall, Chief Human Resources Officer. Thank you, Ms. Frimpong and other uh, board members, as well as Dr. Rogers, as well as our Chief of Staff, Ms. Charlie Green and Mr. Doug Handy. Uh, today, we're happy to be back with you to as a follow up from our previous meeting. Today, I have co-presenting with me, Ms. Susan Stansberry, Director of Staffing. Also in attendance, uh, we have uh, Mr. Michael Hodge, our Executive Director for Staffing and Compliance, as well as Ms. Carla Simons, the uh, Manager for Certification. Next slide, please. In our last meeting, uh, the committee did ask us as a follow up to bring two additional items, at least information that we presented previously, but additional information regarding our current BCPS principal demographic trend data, as well as our current BCPS, uh, as well as, as compared to other school districts uh, for their recruitment efforts to diversify uh, their uh, teacher workforce. Next slide, please. In our previous meeting, I did share with you the uh, principal demographics, but in this here, I want you to keep in mind that uh, as always the, um, the demographics and of course the information that we're sharing with you is always uh, fluid, especially during our uh, spring as well as our uh, summer months. Um, so this uh, graph that you see here is actually a span of a seven year span encompassing school years 2017 to 2018, uh, all the way through 2023-2024 of the demographics of our various school principals, uh, school administrators here in BCPS. The percentage, as you'll see here, um, actually increased for our Asian school principals from 0.75% to 1.69% over that seven-year span. Our uh, African American uh, school principals increased from 19.32% to 23%. Our Hispanic and Latino overall, of course, had a decrease from 1.7% to 1.12%. And then that of our uh, white administrators uh, decreased from 78.4% to 74.16%. I think of what was actually shared with you previously. Of course, if you notice, we have actually 176 schools. What we he see here is we have 178. One of the things I just want to bring to your mind is that we have a, um, in order to make sure that there's continuity for our staff as well as for our students, uh, we have two administrators who are actually soon to retire. Um, who are actually principals on assignment. So we do have 176 schools, 178 principals that would include our principals on assignment. But once again, we want to make sure that we had continuity of uh, for our students 
as well as for staff. So uh, those schools would not go without a principal or change of principals with mid year. So with that said, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Ms. Susan Stansbury, who will talk about uh, our recruitment efforts that were successful, as well as those uh, individual uh, school systems that also uh, within the region that had other successful uh, means of diversifying their teacher workforce. So the next staff, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. On this slide, we have listed our top efforts um, that we've been working on here in staffing to diversify our workforce. Um, as you can see from the slide, many of our neighboring counties have similar initiatives to those that we have here at BCPS. <coughs> The, I, the specific efforts that we have found here to be um, of our, our biggest opportunity and, and where we found our greatest success um, has been the BCPS hosted events as well as our grow our own initiatives. Um, the national teacher shortage has been building over the last several years and the expectation is that it will continue. So we will constantly be reevaluating our data um, regarding our efforts in, to diversify in order to make sure that we are doing the best job we can to succeed. Um, we are currently working on identifying ways to expand our grow our own efforts as we see the success in our initiative and we know that both montgomery county public schools as well as pg county public schools have been successfully um, expanding their efforts with the grow our own initiatives as well next slide please That does conclude the information um, that we had provided to answer the questions for today were there any questions Are there any questions? I do not see any hands raised, but if there are questions, board members, feel free to unmute and ask a question. Okay. But that's it. Thank you all once again. So, Mr. McCall, I do have one question. Sure. This is board member from Pong. So, for the um, for the principal slide, um, can you explain that again about the 178, even though there's more so there are more principals than schools. And is this a snapshot at the beginning of the year or the end? This would be at the beginning of the year, correct? This is, is the, correct. okay. Coming okay. into the 24, 25 school year, uh, there are two principals who are, uh, who are soon to retire. And so instead of the mid year or it's a mid quarter uh, principal retiring and then having to change principals, we went, of course, uh, post it people applied and went through the regular process and went to the board for you all's approval. And uh, those individuals are there. The, the two individuals, as I said before, will soon to be retiring soon. Okay, got it. Thank you. So this sure. is um, a, a proactive approach because then we'll have consistency and, and continuity with those schools as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Mr. McCall and his staff? All right. Thank you, Mr. McCall. And Thank you. All right. Have a good day. You too. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is the update on the equity strategic plan. And for that, I call on Mr. Douglas Handy, Executive Director of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Thank you, Ms. Frampong. Um, I do have a request. Um, we have um, Superintendent Dr. Rogers here with us on the call. Um, she has the next item on the agenda. She's going to be part of that presentation. So my request is that we move to that item. And then if we could come back to uh, this item, the strategic plan uh, before we close out. So that's my request. Sure, no worries. So what we're doing is we're still keeping the same agenda items. We're just switching the order for right now. Yes, please. Okay. All right. So that's fine. And so now okay. instead of our update on the equity strategic plan, uh, what we're going to have next on our agenda is the equity snapshot. And so for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Good afternoon, Chair Frimpong. Uh, this is Mildred Charlie Green. I'm going to open slides for us. 
um, and then uh, Dr. Rogers will take over. So uh, good afternoon, Chair from Prong, members of the Equity Committee. I'm here today, along with our superintendent, Dr. Rogers, to present information about K through 12 academic data points disaggregated by ethnicity and student service groups. What you see on the slide before you are our four priority areas. We always like to start any conversation about students and student data with uh, the four priorities that guide us. Uh, today's conversation is going to center on academic achievement. We recognize that the work of equity spans multiple uh, topics and all four of the priorities, but our focus today really is on academic achievement for all students. Please move to the next slide. Our work is also informed by the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Uh, the slide before you illustrates the five pillars of the Blueprint. And while we have done considerable, considerable work advancing equitable outcomes in the area of early childhood education, uh, today's focus really is on pillars three and four. I do want to highlight that work with early childhood education because the pre-K expansion alone, we know, uh, is going to create a foundation that will make sure that all students are able to achieve at high levels as they advance through Baltimore County Public Schools. Next slide. So as I said, um, Pillar 3 and Pillar 4 are really uh, the focus of today's presentation. Um, when you take a look at Pillar 3, the focus is college and career readiness. And the, the purpose of these components really is to increase readiness and reduce gaps among students. They include access to rigorous academic courses, career and technical education, and career and college, um, uh, college and career counseling. Next slide, please. Pillar four focuses on resources that contribute to the success of all students. And so I want to just call your attention to uh, some of the components depicted on the slide increases in funding for special education and for multilingual learners, uh, additional funding and services to be provided for struggling learners, and the establishment um, and the enhancement of community schools in areas of concentrated poverty. We know that the impact of these resources will lead to improved outcomes. And these are just some of the resources um, that are highlighted here. And then the next slide. And this before you is the BCPS Pathway to Success. Uh, basically, it's our roadmap to achieving the priorities outlined by both the system priorities as well as the blueprint. We know that these identified markers are predictors of student success for all student, all student groups. And so at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers to share information on how system efforts have impacted student outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Charlie Green. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee chair, uh, board member Frimpong. I believe I saw vice chair Harvey. Board member Stileski who are here. Um, I am pleased to uh, provide for you information and walk you through the equity snapshot. Um, as uh, Ms. Charlie Green alluded to, uh, these are a variety of data points that we disaggregate for the uh, school system that really contribute to students being able to um, meet these markers uh, that are in front of you, these key indicators of college career and community readiness. And so the first one, uh, first thing that we'll do is uh, to describe the legend. So next slide, please. And so in the report that follows, uh, this was created by the, our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment. Uh, you find key academic data points that we use for the entire school system disaggregated by ethnicity and student service group. The legend is very simple. If it is in green, it is an area of growth. If it is in red, it is an area of regression where we need to take a look and interrogate what's happening and put some other um, action steps in place. Um, on this slide, it talks about equity in action. Uh, we have committed ourselves to moving beyond um, equity as an idea to ensure that our core purpose, which is learning for all students, is evident in our progress as we move throughout the system. And so for the we're going to start with attendance, which is the most important um, indicator. Please move to the next slide. So one of the things that we shared with the entire school system is as a school system, we had the highest growth across the state of Maryland in students uh, 
coming to school on a regular basis. Um, largest percentage of decrease. Uh, and we were not only proud of this uh, because of the numbers in the aggregate, but we also along the way were monitoring student progress disaggregated by ethnicity, by student group, by level, by gender, um, by zone. And uh, what we see on this slide in front of us is when we look at elementary school, the first line you see is a decrease for all elementary students. But then when it's disaggregated to look at how our students who are Black, African American, Hispanic, students who are economically disadvantaged, our multilingual learners and our special education students. What is their progress look like? You compare 2022 to 20, uh, 22, 23 school year to this past school year, and you see it's green all the way down that all groups are making progress. Middle school, um, you see the same data points. And again, we see for all of the disaggregated group that uh, there is a reduction in chronic absenteeism and the same pattern follows for high school students. Next slide, please. This next, next indicator is MAP, our measures of academic progress. As you know, we provide uh, these assessments to our students three times a year in the fall, in the winter, uh, and in the spring. Uh, particularly, we're looking for growth and we have uh, targets for our students as well as their performance. And so uh, for the top quadrant of this uh, slide, you'll see our math results. Uh, overall for the school system, when we looked at math, math for growth, we saw um, gains for all students in the aggregate. When we disaggregated that data for the same student groups, you saw growth across all of those student groups. And when we looked at the percentage of students that met the 61st percentile and above benchmark um, across the system, there was an increase of uh, more than 3% of students who were at the 61st or above percentile. But then when that data was disaggregated, we saw uh, patterns of growth as well for our students who are Black, African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, and special education students. Um, the key is the same for uh, reading. Uh, what we know is that there is growth for all in the aggregate, as well as these disaggregated student groups and student service groups. When we look at the 61st percentile and above, the data was flat for the year, but we did, did see growth for our Black African American students, as well as our Hispanic students. Slight regression. Um, of one tenth of a percent for our students who are economically disadvantaged and our multilingual learners um, who are students who are learning academic language and they are learning the English language. Um, special education students were flat. Next slide, please. This is state assessment data. On one side, you see the mathematics data. On the other side, we have our literacy data. Uh, what you'll note is last year for our uh, Algebra 1 data across the state rolled up in the aggregate, there were gains of more than 7%, almost 8%. And we also saw um, gains for other student groups, uh, disaggregated uh, Black African American um, as well as um, uh, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, and special education students. For math overall, when we were looking at the different grade levels for math performance on the state assessment, um, there was growth in the aggregate um, in elementary school as well as middle school. The um, uh, we we have a, a asterisk in the high school, but when you disaggregate the data for all of these uh, student groups as well as the service groups, um, we see growth and progress with the exception of middle school special education students where there was one tenth of a percent regression. Looking at literacy, uh, we find growth in the aggregate for elementary school students, growth for all disaggregated groups with the exception of one tenth of a percent for our multilingual learners in elementary school. Uh, middle school, there is growth uh, in the aggregate as well as growth for all disaggregated groups. And high school, there is growth in the aggregate 
growth for all groups with the exception of our multilingual learners in high school, there is a 3% uh, decrease there uh, with an increase also for our students receiving special education services. Next slide, please. This slide uh, speaks to our AP course participation and our exam results. Um, part of our efforts are to ensure that there's opportunity and access provided to uh, a wide array of students in our school system. Uh, we had increased our uh, participation in the aggregate, uh, but you also will note this, we also increase participation for students who are black, African American, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, and special education students. Um, for AP exam results, a three or above is uh, what the College Board identifies as uh, students demonstrating uh, uh, mastery of uh, college level um, material. In the aggregate, there was a, a decrease in the aggregate, a slight decrease, a little more than uh, 1%. However, there is an increase in the performance of black African-American students, decrease commensurate and a decrease with the overall numbers for Hispanic students, but an increase for students who are economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, and students receiving special education services. Next slide, please. And the last measure is grade nine on track. Uh, this is one of the most important measures of high school. Um, it has been well documented by research that ninth grade is the most, uh, tends to be the most uh, difficult year for students. Um, and it also tends to be a strong indicator of future success in high school, graduating on time, being able to attain college and career readiness. And so uh, a student is classified as being on track in ninth grade when they earn at least five credits. Uh, they do not fail any more than one semester of a core um, area. Those uh, core area classes are mathematics, literacy, social studies, and science, and they are not chronically absent. We made some uh, gains in the aggregate, improvement of 4.5% overall, but we also saw steady improvements in our disaggregated student groups, our Black African American students, Hispanic students, students who are economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, as well as our students receiving special education services. I believe this is our last data point, and so I'd like to pause and answer any questions that you might have around uh, this data. Board members, are there any questions so far? Uh, good, good afternoon. This is uh, Board Member Harvey. Um, was this was someone else? I heard someone else. You can go ahead, Ms. Harvey. Okay, thank you. I just didn't want to interrupt. Is there uh, some information you can share in terms of the story? What is the story behind the numbers? Like what what's working, what we've been doing that is pushing uh, achievement up and what is happening for those uh, disaggregated groups, those student groups where we've lost some ground? Yes, so um, the next few slides really speak to what's happening um, across the system and then what's happening individually in schools. But anecdotally, I'll share with you that um, it, it's really intentionality around moving to equity and action, making sure that individual plans at school level um, really uh, reflect the needs of the students, that the members of the leadership team understand what their current data is, that they are goal setting at the beginning of the year, and that they are, as we're providing differentiated resources, that they're um, intervening early and that they're monitoring and providing support and giving access to students. Uh, that's why the uh, 
the data point on advanced placement um, is so critically important that it's not only, uh, it, it is not uh, reducing the number of students who have access, it's increasing the number of students who have access, but supporting them um, throughout the way to make sure that they have a smooth transition to higher level uh, courses, but also making sure that they have uh, access to supports around the instruction. And so there are some things that we're doing for um, uh, there are some things that we're doing specifically around school progress plans, um, and uh, I believe uh, Ms. Charlie Green uh, will speak to that, so I don't want to be uh, redundant, but the, but the short of the story is it's a lot of intentional focus. Um, we have a very clear template on how we plan for students, and um, we are also monitoring at the central office level how our students are doing in real time, and that helps us to identify patterns to um, provide just-in-time supports and the work that teachers are doing in professional learning communities where they're looking at their data helps them to go right back into the classroom and identify what specific students need. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Frempong, was there a Question from Ms. Chika Kalu. Well, I only had one, but I was going to ask, um, well, you kind of already answered it in terms of the specific indicators that we were putting, but for the students who were increasing in AP exam courses, but like for the Hispanic students, is there any way that moving forward we can particularly target it to make sure that those students are actually prepared to do well in those courses or just to target support towards AP courses or are we just doing CCR readiness components across the board? So it's it's a, a yes to both. Um, schools are very aware they receive their data. College Board provides that data pretty quickly in terms of a turnaround. Um, they've identified uh, the students who uh, maybe it's not for the same AP exam as many times students don't typically take the uh, same AP exam, but they're looking at a student's uh, AP exam portfolio to identify how the students did on assessments. Is it one assessment um, or is it several assessments? And what does that mean in terms of ongoing preparation throughout the school year, as well as as students start to ramp up for the exams, what the support is that they might provide. Um, so in the aggregate, we're looking that, at that and doing that work for our um, students and many schools have created programs, but um, you also have some targeted uh, efforts that are occurring. So for any of these groups of students, so while uh, 95, 97 percent of this report uh, is in the green. Um, you know, there there are, um, I think, maybe three or four data points uh, where there was some regression out of the three or four. Um, I think two of them were above one tenth of a percent uh, in the cases schools have their specific data where they're uh, looking to make sure that they target resources. And that's part of what we spoke about at a previous board meeting and how we have um, shifted equitable resource allocation, particularly use of our grants um, and what that support looks like in our elementary schools, our middle schools, and when necessary, our high schools as well, um, so that students can have exactly uh, what they need. So it's both. It's both in the aggregate as well as individualized students. Okay, thank you. And then for You're another welcome. one, it was like with the data presenteeism is great given that we have the greatest reduction, but for the methods that we use or the re like the resources we use to like we implemented in order to achieve these rates, have we been able to see which one has been the most effective and which efforts have been the least effective or are we just continuing to push these efforts across the board. So we're continuing to push the efforts across the board because we saw that with a concentrated effort on reducing chronic absenteeism, uh, that yielded some great significant gains for our students um, across the board, disaggregated and in the aggregate. And so that specifically is a centralized, uh, focused and plan uh, on attendance where every school has their own 
um, uh, incentives where there is tracking of the data reporting back to the uh, students, but we are adding another layer uh, because while we're seeing great progress, uh, there are some students that are still um, having difficulty with attendance and that other layer includes student success uh, mentors um, and just some differentiated support. So uh, in those areas uh, where we're finding that students need uh, more assistance, families need more assistance to get students to school. It's uh, another layer on top of what we're doing for the whole system. We've also had, um, you know, local pediatricians, uh, different partners uh, sharing the message that students need to be in school with families every time that they um, see them and that they're asking questions when they see students aren't in school during hours when they should be in school. So really bringing the community into um, the expectations, giving families uh, tracking um, uh, capabilities so that they're able to, um, you know, just put on their refrigerator a calendar and monitor and really be positive and proactive about the importance of attendance. Uh, that's what we're doing as a school system. So we're keeping the um, our our focus uh, because we need everybody in school, but we're also providing some additional differentiated assistance uh, to specific students uh, that still need to continue to improve their attendance. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, last question, but on the point of like the differentiated assistance for the multilingual learners, because they didn't have as great as a growth in their math reading, are there going to be specific literary interventions for those students as well so that way we can accelerate their reading growth? Or is it still going to be like as we've been doing now, like the continuous wraparound services, are we going to channel more of that for reading for Matt, so that's we're... not what we're doing. What we're doing is um, we just approved a, a brand new and started implementing this year a brand new ELD curriculum. Um, so uh, that is what the focus is on the professional development for the teachers to implement with fidelity a high quality curriculum that is standards based and evidence based and practices that help students to develop academic language as well as um, uh, you know uh, more robust writing skills. That is the strategy that were full into implementation and this was um, an additional year year um, I think it's uh, year three of us more of our multilingual learners uh, returning to their home schools and so we're providing more resources as part of the FY25 budget uh, we added uh, many more uh, multilingual learner teachers uh, across our schools uh, K through 12 so that that's the, the supports that they're receiving. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. This is a uh, board member from Pong. I had a follow up question based on Ms. Chikakalu, and that is, as you talk about the um, multilingual learners going back to their home schools, so no longer being at regional programs, um, because I think that's a it's a phase process, if I remember correctly. Are we starting to see improvements or is there disruption um, based on them returning to their home schools? And if there's disruption, do we expect that's just because we're still kind of doing this transition and we would expect it to, to course correct? But what is the trend at this point? We are seeing improvements. Um, I was in a meeting at uh, one o'clock where I was looking at recent student data from uh, this quarter, and we're seeing some great gains for our multilingual uh, learners, and you know uh, we want to see that continue. Um, and uh, part of the conversation was around the sense of belongingness uh, that our students are experiencing, and when as the uh, resources are provided at the home school, um, you know the impact that that's having on the uh, students and the families that are they're a part of the community. They can stay afterwards for um, interventions and supports and or clubs and activities, and that's making a difference in terms of their progress. We are very um, intentional about uh, rolling out the new curriculum, and uh, our expectations are uh, when implemented with fidelity, fidelity we're going to see uh, even more uh, progress for our multilingual learners. Thank you. And then I guess, is that also, again, is this transition from a regional center to homeschool, is that also showing uh, or having a, a, an impact on 
the chronic absenteeism? Is it because now with the schools being uh, closer to where their actual homes are located that there's an improvement in attendance? I, I, would, I would suspect um, that, that that is a very true statement. We know that our multilingual learners that have, have had a uh, very good, uh, made very good progress in um, attendance. And, and I would think that um, that is a contributing factor. I think you're correct. Thank you. Okay, and then, um, so a separate question, uh, but speaking to this chronic absenteeism, and so we saw the breakdown across elementary school, middle school, and high school, and um, there's different levels of improvement based on um, whether it was elementary, middle, or high school, mm -hmm. so it did vary. Um, are those efforts then for chronic absenteeism, is it the same? Um, across all levels, or is it differentiated because what's working for fourth graders is not necessarily what's going to work for 10th graders? So I guess, can you just speak to some of those efforts, what they currently are? So overall, the effort is uh, awareness for families. It's the Here For It campaign. Um, where it's differentiated is around the incentives. I would say elementary school, middle school, and high school, as I walk into the schools to um, uh, pay visits, I'm seeing them track attendance by grade level. Um, but uh, for uh, one school, you know, the Ravens might come out, whereas another school students might earn um, tickets uh, towards uh, something or they, they might end up, uh, you know, on some kind of uh, broadcast for the school uh, as they're competing. So, so within a school, the leadership team decides, you know, what, how they're going to incentivize the students, but the uh, major focus is on making sure that improvement um, in attendance is uh, prioritized in the schools. I would also share that um, nationally and Baltimore County Public Schools is the same, that middle school is the area, even though you would think it was high school, but middle school is the area, um, you know, that, that there is a little more difficulty around attendance and you know that has to do with uh, the adolescent brain and all the changes that the students are going um, through during that time. So we we definitely saw some improvement in middle school, uh, but you know the uh, middle school uh, principals as well as the um, uh, support from central office are uh, really getting in schools to find out uh, from students what's going to help uh, to make that difference. The younger the students are, uh, we also work in partnership with the families, particularly with our youngest learners, as the students aren't the ones uh, who make the decisions about um, uh, who make the decisions about um, uh, you know about how how they get to school, and and so we. We are trying uh, just just a variety of things to really meet the needs of our uh, students. I did just receive a note. I am uh, in another location and uh, would like to be able to. I think Miss Steleski has uh, one more question. Board member Frimpong, uh, as I'm at the Chesapeake uh, Chamber of Commerce and uh, scheduled to speak next, so I'm I'm happy to take that question uh, before I have to move to that. Got you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Doloski. Thank you. OK, I'm going to make this uh, very quick. Thank you so much for all of this detail. And it really does seem that the focus on equity is achieving, you know, steady results. We have a long way to go, but um, it, it is nice to see trends heading in the right direction. My only thought was, um, given the training that the board had with um, equity. I wonder if um, this data could just be shared with the board. I think that they would appreciate seeing the positive trends as well, and then possibly even with the public to just raise awareness about, um, you know, about equity and, you know, how important it is for all of the students in the system. And thank you. You're welcome. All of those things are scheduled. Our principals received it. You, uh, we have shared that we were going to debut it through the equity committee, uh, given you know your charge and your area of focus. Um, it will uh, be shared with everyone, and this is an external report that will be posted. So all those things are already in the works. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Enjoy, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. You're welcome.
Chair Frimpong, as uh, Dr. Rogers uh, goes off to, to speak at the Chamber of Commerce, there were two additional slides she'd like me to go through just to complete the picture of how this works at the school level. Thank you. And so, Thank so what you. Dr. Rogers explained was the equity snapshot and how it guides the work at the system level. Um, there is analogous work that happens at the school level and then even in smaller groups at what we call um, professional learning communities or PLCs at that level. So schools um, actually receive an analogous equity snapshot that includes just their student data, not the whole system. They use that to identify where there may be gaps, uh, work that needs to be done. Um, they identify student groups as well as, you know, content areas where students need additional support. And they are able to then plan for um, action steps, things that they will do to try to address those needs. Needs. And so they create goals around those needs. There is regular monitoring. And then at the professional learning community or PLC level, um, content teachers uh, look at student performance data and, you know, monitor progress, um, make adjustments as they move forward to ensure that students continue to achieve. And so I just wanted to make certain that anyone listening understood that what Dr. Rogers painted was a picture of kind of the systemic view. And as she indicated, uh, there was a meeting earlier today where we looked at how we looked as a system, but the expectation is that school leaders are doing the same work with their own personalized data, which as she indicated, they uh, have received some already and they'll receive this today. And then school teams uh, drill down even further uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Schools have uh, access to a number of different tools to be able to address gaps. Dr. Rogers spoke uh, specifically about the new ELD curriculum, and I wanted to share that that new ELD curriculum, one of the reasons why we uh, that, that was implemented, it was because of gaps that were exposed in terms of, you know, uh, learning that was happening with that particular subgroup. And so students uh, with this new curriculum that is aligned with state standard and also really has a focus on academic language, we believe that it is part of why we are seeing the gains that we are seeing with some of our multilingual learners. And that came from just a deep dive into the data uh, at both the system and the school level. So again, that ELD curriculum, those additional ESOL teachers or um, to, to work with our multilingual learners, the move from centers to home schools, all of those were data-driven decisions based on this kind of process. Um, additionally, I'll just highlight some of the work that we've done that also speaks to um, the data reviews that we've been doing at both the system, school, and team level, um, making summer school mandatory, identifying the students who should attend summer school. Those are all uh, related to um, looking at this data. And then certainly even the curriculum we used in summer school really pointed to gaps that were exposed as we did these uh, data discussions at various levels high dosage tutoring, a research-based practice that we know closes gaps and certainly supports student learning. We were able to implement that at multiple levels and identify students based on that data. At the middle school level, which we know is a level that's greatly impacted by chronic absenteeism, as well as a number of factors, um, all of our middle schools are implementing advisories, which identifies time during the day for reteaching, reassessment, students to receive that high dose tutoring, all of it embedded in the school day, as well as um, perhaps work with a success mentor to be able to help move them forward. And then the last thing I'll point out, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's an example of the kind of work we do uh, in response to data, is uh, the equitable resource allocation that we've used to be able to provide supplemental staffing in areas where there was you know, need. Uh, we identified at the elementary level the need for uh, not only a reading specialist, but also math coaches. And so that was something that was part of the last budget, and we appreciate the board's support in that area, but we believe that that is making a difference for students as well. And so really looking at where the needs are, making sure that everyone gets what they need um, at a foundational level, but then looking at how we can provide additional support, uh, innovative practices, as well as curriculum tools and resources to continue to see growth. And so the uh, equity snapshot shared by Dr. Rogers, as she indicated, uh, is going to be public facing. 
Um, it's gone out to principals. We did indicate we would debut it at this meeting. Um, it will be received by everyone. And then as we do reports to the board ongoing, all of our data will be disaggregated by student group and ethnicity uh, with the goal ultimately being to continue to make this a dynamic document. And so um, there will be updates forthcoming. Um, I, I do know that we haven't quite figured out the rhythm of what that will look like, but certainly every report that we provide at the board table will disaggregate in this way and inform uh, eventually this report. And so the next slide I believe just says thank you. Um, I, I do believe that Dr. Rogers spoke very specifically to the work overall, but if there are any uh, remaining questions that perhaps I can answer, I am available and happy to do so. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Do we have any additional questions? Hello? Okay, so I am not seeing, let's see, I'm trying to navigate across people. I do not sure. see hands raised. Okay. So I do have a couple of questions and I understand if you're not able to answer them as Charlie Green, um, but maybe we can just then uh, incorporate them for follow up um, into our next meeting like we did for this one. Um, so I appreciate you and the staff and just everybody working together on getting this data for us so that we are able to see um, this information. We know that um, these reports have started uh, a couple of years ago, actually, even prior to COVID, um, when there were certain disparities that were highlighted in BCPS. So while there was extensive information, there were a couple of areas that I was also, um, I guess, interested in hearing about the data, and I did not yet see those on the, the graph. So one area that was identified was AP. Um, as far as the courses that were being taken, and then... Um, the other one was the test themselves as far as passing three and plus. But what about um, identification? So we think about elementary school, middle school, and high school. Um, how are we doing with identifying, um, you know, students of different ethnicities as well as different service groups for the GT programs? And um, so I'm not sure, did... I'm trying to look back again, I'm sorry, just to make sure I didn't miss it. Uh, that was not included in this report. And okay. we, we focused in this report on um, academic markers. So we didn't include, for example, suspension rates and, and, and things of that nature, uh, because we were really looking at that trajectory or that pathway to success. Um, you know, additional information as we pro provide reports to the board will be disaggregated and it will you know this report will be augmented and so it is not um it is not meant to be an exhaustive report it really is looking at those academic indicators that were um on the pathway and so certainly we can look at early identification for gt um we also did not include ib just in case someone was looking for it we have roughly a hundred um under 200, 137, 167, I can't remember the exact number and I don't want um, to, to um, rely on my faulty memory, but I do know it was under 200 students. And so we felt that that number was not representative and we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and add that information at, a, at another time. And so again, not exhaustive, but happy to take back any question, particularly as it relates to GT and we can follow up at the next meeting if you would like. Okay, great. Thank you. And also, yep, that was the next one was IB. You actually mm -hmm. touched on all the, the different ones. So IB, and then as well as when we do talk about suspension rates, because one thing that had been identified was there is a discrepancy when the suspension rate is broken down via ethnicity. We see that there are certain groups in particular, it's, it's Black and African American that are suspended at, depending on the school level, but, but it could be three and a half times the rate or you know even like 1.7, but it's it varies depending on what the level is. But we do have variation in the suspension rates when we disaggregate it. And I understand this is academic um, indicators, but that would be something I think that's important as well because with students being suspended, it's less time than that they're in school and receiving instruction, and so that suspension is going to have an impact on um, 
their academics as well. So that would just be something else um, that we would be interested in seeing. Absolutely. And so um, the, the plan is as we provide updates um, according to each of the priorities, it will inform this document. And so, you know, when we uh, we certainly will look at safety and overall suspension rates as well as social emotional well being, and we'll bring that information uh, to the equity committee. Happy to do that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so we switched. Are there any other questions for um, Ms. Charlie Green on the equity snapshot? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Thank you. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back and cover an item in the agenda. We are going to do the update on the equity strategic plan. And for that, we're going to have Mr. Douglas Handy, Executive Director of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Thank you, Ms. Frimpong. Uh, so good afternoon again to all the uh, board committee members. Um, I will be sharing with you an update on the 2024-2025 strategic plan for the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Uh, the strategic plan guides the work of my department throughout this current school year. Next slide, please. So in 2023-2024, when Dr. Rogers began her tenure as superintendent, the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency was shifted to the division of the chief of staff. To emphasize that the work of the department is system wide and it covers all areas of BCPS. The purpose of the strategic plan is to ensure that my team aligns our work to Dr. Rogers' priorities and to our team's values, beliefs, mission, and vision. In developing the strategic plan, my team confers with the divisions of schools, curriculum and instruction, operations, fiscal services, and human resources to ensure that equity in action is the focus throughout BCPS. Also, my team will solicit multi-stakeholder input on the plan in an effort to promote systems and structures for academic programs, social emotional supports, and business operations that are equitable for all BCPS students, teachers, leaders, staff, and community members. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you uh, the status of our plan and it's really captured here in the timeline that you see on the screen. Uh, we did start developing the plan in May. Uh, my team actually goes into retreat mode uh, where we really uh, take a couple of days to really start digging into uh, what we wanna work on in alignment again with uh, Dr. Rogers' uh, goals, visions, and focus areas. So we started developing that plan in May of 2024. We actually paused the development um, intentionally. Um, you may recall um, starting in June and throughout the summer, BCPS had a, a very robust professional learning plan that cut across uh, multiple uh, staff positions. And we wanted to make sure that we engaged in the professional learning and were um, very observant. So we knew uh, how that professional learning would inform our plan development. So once the summer wrapped up, we reconvened as a team in September. We did complete the first draft of our plan. And the current month, uh, we are incorporating uh, feedback to the plan. We're starting to revise the plan uh, based on what we're even seeing going into the school year. And then when I come back in November, I will present the plan um, to this committee um, to get your, uh, for your review and for your feedback. And then on a quarterly basis throughout the school year, um, my team and I will review the plan. Again, we'll get input from other stakeholders across BCPS um, internally and externally, and then we will um, update the status of each initiative. Um, so we do those quarterly updates just to see where we are um, in regards to our plan. And then that really goes right into uh, the following May 2025, and we'll start the process all over again. So that's been uh, the approach my team has taken, and we're gonna do the same this year. Um, really looking to incorporate more feedback um, from uh, stakeholders as we go forward to try to sharpen that plan. And next slide, please. So uh, that's really all um, I wanted to share, just a snapshot, let you know where we were. Um, and then looking forward to coming back again in November and giving you the overview of the plan um, and gathering feedback from you all. So at this point, uh, Ms. Frampong, I'll turn it back to you, see if um, 
any committee members have any questions for me. Thank you, Mr. Handy, for the overview. Do we have any questions? Okay. Not seeing hands raised. Okay. All right. So if there are no questions, we will um, move on to the next item, which is announcements. Uh, before we do that, I do just want to say thank you to all of our uh, speakers, our presenters today who spoke and then those who also took the time to um, support the speakers in putting together the data for us um, so that we would have the information. So the last item on our agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, November 7th, 2024 at 4 p.m. The next equity committee meeting with the Equity Council is scheduled for Thursday, November 21st, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. Is there any further business? Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Hi, this is, this is Ms. Harvey. I just had um, a, a follow-up question that maybe we can hear more information on in one of the upcoming meetings. In the last meeting, we were given that uh, very detailed presentation on hiring and equity practices around hiring and retaining uh, qualified staff. And one of the things that we talked about were what are some short term ways that we could get diversity uh, in front of students as we continue to improve this this uh, practice of hiring diverse staff at a rate of like one to two percent per year, which is around the national average. And so I just would like an update on uh, strategies, any strategies, particularly there was a program. Uh, that used to be in play uh, that we may be able to put in play again to get some diversity in, in front of students in the classroom as we continue to work on our hiring and retention practices. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Harvey, you had brought that up in the last meeting, and I believe there was even a question about guest lack guest lecturers. I believe it was coming into the classroom, and so while that was something I think that um, may have been under CTE. Again, there was more discussion about how we could do that in um, just the classroom setting. So um, we can talk more offline, I guess, with the appropriate staff about getting um, update on that for the next meeting. But thank you for bringing that back to our attention. Anything else from any other board members? Okay, so hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for joining us.